Good morning, and welcome to this morning's uh, staff colloquium. Our guest speaker today is uh, Ken Alder. He's going to talk about the measure of all things, uh, the seven-year odyssey, and the hidden er that transformed the world. Um, I was just thinking, uh, you know, the measure of all things. I wonder why we didn't choose that sort of for the NIST motto, the measure of all things. And then I thought of it a little bit, and I thought, well, you know, we could have done that, but it would have been a committee. And the committee would have said, the measure of most things, you know, <laughs> or the measure of the most important things, or the highest priority things. But the measure of all things, you might, it might be safe, Ken, that uh, it's going to be your book and not our motto. Uh, I've talked to a few people during this week uh, about this talk and about uh, lab tours afterwards and things, and it seemed like everybody knew Ken, because when I said Ken Alder is coming to talk about his, uh, the measure of all things in his book, everybody said, oh, Ken's coming, oh, great. And I asked Ken this morning, I said, do you know all these people? He said, not really. <laughs> so apparently people have read the book, and they've liked it, and uh, they've liked it so much that they, they, they talk about Ken. <clears throat> uh, well, who is Ken? Uh, Ken is a physicist and historian. Uh, according to his website, he was conceived at Bell Labs in Murray Hill <laughs> and, and raised in Berkeley, California. And I can only conclude from that that that's, you know, to some extent, the reason why he's sort of attracted to things that are scientific and engineering and also cross-cultural. And he's also interested in the influence of science, uh, the, the relationship between science and, and culture. He got his bachelor's degree in physics at Harvard, where he graduated Phi Beta Kappa. He went on at Harvard to get a PhD in the history of science. And today, he, uh, ever since then, actually, he's been a professor of history at Northwestern University near Chicago. Uh, he's also the director of the uh, program at Northwestern University that uh, is focused on science in human culture. Uh, Ken has written four books uh, during his career. Uh, the most recent one uh, is uh, published in 2007. It was called Lie Detectors, The History of an American Obsession. Uh, uh, that book, as well as the 2002 book, The Measure of All Things, is out uh, out side there, the Borders Books is here today, and uh, they're here to, to let you look at the books and uh, decide whether or not you'd like to buy one. Uh, 1997 was his uh, first book. It was called The Engineering the Revolution. It was about the relationship between science and democracy during the French Revolution. And that was a, an important book for him because it was a, a winner of a prestigious prize, the 1998 uh, Dexter Prize, and nowadays called the Edelstein Prize of the Society for the History of Technology. Uh, there is a fourth book, an earlier book, it was a novel that was written when he was still a struggling artist in Berkeley. Uh, the Measure of All Things is the 2002 book and the one we're gonna hear about today. It was extremely popular. Uh, it's been translated into 13 languages it was, in 2002, cited as a best book of the year by uh, most uh, newspapers that you've heard of, The Economist, The New York Times, uh, The Sunday Times and The Sunday Telegraph of uh, London, as well as uh, pl magazines like Discover Magazine. Uh, it won a prize for the best book in European history. It was called the Kagan Prize of the Historical Society. It also won the best book uh, prize for the best book on the history of science for a general audience. Uh, two prizes, actually, the Davis Prize of the History of Science Society and the Dingle Prize of the British Society for the History of Science. An even better uh, recommendation for the book is the fact that everybody I've talked to who's read the book here at NIST said that they loved it. Uh, his newest book uh, will be about the history of forensic science and uh, to that extent, I've been telling Ken a little bit about the, uh, the Office of Law Enforcement Standards and the forensic science that uh, goes on here at NIST. And uh, after lunch, we'll see uh, one of those labs as well. So without further ado, let me introduce to you Ken Alder. <clears throat> Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill, for that introduction. Can you hear me? I'm mic'd. 
Yeah, conceived in Murray Hills. My, my mother doesn't like that, <laughs> but it's true, <laughs> at least by subtraction. Um, let me see if this works. Great. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Bill. And I'm really delighted to be able and honored to be able to speak to you here today at the American Center of All Things Metrical. And I look forward to answering your questions after the talk. And I should say, it feels uh, a little incongruous to be here as if i am come to Fort Knox to speak about the history of gold. And I'm very delighted you're actually taking me into the vault later today to see the original meter. Um, but today I do plan to take you back 200 years in history to the period of the French Revolution and the story of the origins of the first meter. Now it may seem like old history, but I also hope to show you that history can help us think through contemporary assumptions especially those that we no longer interrogate because we consider them so obvious or banal. But they're not obvious and they're not banal. I hope my talk makes you reconsider, first of all, the status of measurement standards as natural, the meaning of error, the origins of the science of geodesy, and finally how all these matters seemingly relate to something that on its surface appears quite different, debates over globalization. But first, I met, I'm sure that many of you wistfully uh, recall the story from almost a decade ago, the story of the NASA satellite known as the Mars Climate Orbiter. I know you didn't want to hear about it, but it is an important way to think about um, the problem of me uh, measurement. Uh, it was launched from Florida, as you all know, in 1999 to map the Martian terrain. And I'm sure you remember it mainly for an infamous mishap. Just as the orbiter was settling into final approach, it went missing, presumably because it had crashed into the planet's surface. Why? An investigation revealed that one of the set of project engineers had been using units based on the metric system, and another had used the traditional Anglo-Saxon American units. The result was a $125 million bust-up. Now, of course, I don't have to convince anyone here today that measures matter. If fields of human endeavor were to have official mottos the way that nations do, the motto of modern science might well be in measures we trust. As the great 19th century physicist Lord Kelvin put it, quote, if you can measure that of which you speak and can express it by a number, you know something of your subject. But if you cannot measure it, your knowledge is unsatisfactory, which I take to be British understatement for you don't know what you're talking about. The importance of measures may be a truism to everyone here in this room, but in the not so distant past, I'll try to suggest to you today, measurement had a radically different meaning than what it has today. I wrote the measure of all things in part to show readers how even those things we think of as self-evident are born out of controversy and that science, even the most exacting science, is the product of passionate effort and conflict. This is true of the metric system. Now, in the mid-1970s, during America's last serious attempt to adopt the metric system, I was told by my fifth grade teacher that we would all have to learn the metric system because it was inevitable, because it was the language of the future, and that 95% of the world's people lived in countries that used the metric system and America would soon join them. Well, obviously in the United States, we're still waiting for that future to arrive. And there's a paradox at work here. Because, of course, the United States is supposed to be the lead nation in the pattern of economic globalization, whereas, in fact, it's one of only three countries in the world that does not use the metric system, as I'm sure all of you know, the other two being Liberia and Myanmar. <laughs> you didn't know that. <laughs> Quite illustrious company. Um, as time has gone by and the future failed to arrive, I personally became curious about you know, where this future had come from, the past, as it were, of the future. So I set out to answer a very simple question. Why is a meter a meter? Why is it yo long? Now, as you all know, since uh, 1983, the meter has been defined as the distance equal to the light traveled in a vacuum by 1 over 299,792,458 seconds. Uh, why that number? Well, it was set to equal a 1960 definition based on the length of uh, 1,650,763.73 wavelengths of light from a particular energy transition in Krypton 86, a distance which was itself set to equal the length of a platinum iridium bar built in the latter half of the 19th century. 
a bar whose length was itself based on a platinum bar built in 1799 at the time of the French Revolution so as to equal a particular fraction of the Earth's meridian. Now my book, The Measure of All Things, is the story of that original scientific expedition to measure the Earth so as to calculate the original meter stick. It was in 1792, in the midst of the French Revolution, that two astronomers were sent out from Paris in opposite directions on a mission to measure the size of the world. One astronomer, a man named Delambre, was sent north, and the other astronomer, a man, a man named Méchain, whoops, wrong direction, sorry, was sent south. Their mission was to measure the length of the meridian that runs from Dunkirk to Barcelona so that they might set the length of the new meter, the measure of all things, to one ten millionth of the distance from the North Pole to the equator. Their goal was to establish this new global measure as the permanent standards for all the world's people. In the words of Condorcet, the great optimist of science, it was to be a measure for all people for all time. But why one ten millionth of the distance from the North Pole to the equator. In part because the creators of the metric system knew that the resulting unit would come out to be something on the human scale, roughly yo long, something very near the length of the yard or the on, which was a very widely known unit of measurement in the old regime of France. But why then measure the world at all? As one critic of the metric system wondered at the time, was it really necessary to go so far to find what lay so near? Why indeed? The thing to remember is that in the 18th century, measures did not just differ from country to country, but within countries as well. Measures even differed from one parish to the next. As one visiting Englishman remarked as he traveled through the French countryside, quote, the infinite perplexity of measures exceeds all comprehension. And these are some old measures of France, actual physical items that would have existed in almost any town square or town hall where you could go, and those are sizes for bricks, those are lengths of distance, and there's some volumetric measures as well. Thus, a pint of beer in the town of Saint-Denis, just 10 miles north of Paris, was about one-third larger than the pint of beer in Paris. They had the same name, pint, but one was one-third larger than the other. Now this mind-boggling diversity made travel a torture, impeded commerce, and invited easy fraud. And the revolutionary government of 1792, like the monarchy before it, wanted to rationalize this system to ease the administration of the state and to harmonize and intensify taxation. But for the revolutionaries, uniformity was more than just an administrative convenience. It was integral to their political mission. After all, the diversity of old measures made it, made it difficult for people to know how much they were buying or selling. And until they did, the revolutionaries believed, they would be dependent on others and hence not free. The goal of the metric system then was to make measurement easy and clear in the name of human equality and liberty, as much as to ease commerce and administration. As Condorcet put it, just as the laws of geometry are the same for all people, so too are all people entitled to the same rights and laws and the same weights and measures. But which weights and which measures? The revolutionaries were seeking, in part, of course, to liberate France, but they also had universal aspirations. The revolution was history's great utopian rupture it seemed to offer a chance to design the world anew. So rather than turn to a traditional unit for their new standard, such as, say, the old measures of Paris, right? They could have just simply have taken the Parisian measures and declared them to be the new national measures. They turned instead to nature, to something that was the same for all people, yet belonged to no single nation. And because the new standard was intended for all people throughout the world, they decided to base the measure on the size of the world itself. Of course, Delambre and Méchain were not asked to measure the entire arc. It was enough for them to measure a sector, one which had two endpoints, which reached sea level and which straddled the 45th parallel so that it could stand for the whole of the arc. As luck would have it, the French announced, the only such meridian in the entire world was the meridian that ran through France. 
from Dunkirk to Barcelona. It was a mission of awesome responsibility to create a definitive measure for all future scientific and commercial activity. Hence, the two men were selected for their scrupulousness and integrity, as well as for their scientific ability. As Anton Lavoisier, the father of modern chemistry, and one of the planners of the expedition privately wrote to Méchain, the South Going astronomer, quote, you must not forget, he said, you are carrying out the most important mission that any man has ever been charged with, that you are working for all the nations of the world, and that you are the representative of the Academy of Sciences and all the savants of the universe. As if there were savants on other planets or something. Well, talk about shifting the burden of Atlas onto someone else's shoulders. The years of the revolution were not an easy time to go traveling through French countryside, making measurements of exquisite precision. For seven years, the two men surveyed the terrain, traveling first in opposite directions, and then working their way back slowly towards one another. They had to climb cathedral towers, crumbling fortification turrets, broken volcanoes, and their own jury-rigged observation towers. And the, the obstacles were not physical, but human. Almost every time the men climbed a church tower to conduct their observations, peering with their bizarre instruments off into the distance, they were denounced as spies and often imprisoned as counter-revolutionaries. They crossed battlefronts, uh, survived life-threatening injuries, and did constant battle with superstitious peasants who have always hated surveyors and considered these men to be, in a sense, quite accurately, surveyors. And they almost ended up on the guillotine. Until at last, after seven years, in 1799, they met up in the southern fortress town of Carcassonne, uh, which is on my map, a little bit small, but right there. So you'll notice already a kind of inequality, <laughs> who measures how much and who measures how much, but I'll get to that in a sec. Um, uh, they meet up in Carcassonne and then together return to Paris to present their data to an international committee of the world's leading scientists. It really was the world's first international scientific conference. And you'll note right from the beginning uh, how scientists very quickly figured out the best place to hold a conference was somewhere like Paris that anyone wanted to go. There in Paris, they gathered the most illustrious scientists of Europe, Laplace, uh, Legendre, Lagrange. I mean, these are tremendously famous names, I know, to many of you, um, at least from their eponymous uh, equations and the like as well as invitations went out to, to scientists from Holland, from Italy, and Spain. In fact, all those countries that were then under French military control. And together, they calculated the length of the new measure, which they dubbed the meter, and which they then had enshrined in a bar of pure platinum, the world's newest and most precious metal. It was this bar of 1799 that became the world's universal and legal standard of measure. The results of this great project were then written up in a tremendous treatise, a three-volume, 2,000-page account of the Meridian Expedition entitled Basse du Système Métrique, which we might translate, whoops, um, yeah, okay, that, oh yeah, well, this, I was supposed to go that one. That's the, that's the uh, bar of 1793, it's an earlier temporary bar. Um, the Cadi is obviously the first name for the leader before it's called the leader, and the Gav is the first name for a kilogram when it was thought that the kilogram would be uh, the standard, uh, not the gram, although of course the standard itself is built as a kilogram, as you all know. Um, there's the Basse du Système Métrique. Uh, the primary author of this work was Delambre, the north going astronomer, and he boasted that it contained all the official data formula, and calculations that went into the making of the meter. Accepting this monumental three-volume work uh, from, Napo uh, from Delambre, Napoleon, the new master of France, declared, conquests will come and go, but this work will endure. And in fact, this is Delambre's own copy of the Bastille Système Métrique, which I tracked down in private hands in uh, Santa Barbara. Uh, it's owned by a collector. It's his own, Delambre's own copy, and you can see he's written there, it's Delambre's handwriting. Uh, Les conquêtes passent, mais ces opérations restent. Parole de Nap, Napoleon Bonaparte, à l'auteur de la base. So that's Delambre writing in his, own in his own copy what Napoleon said to him when he presented a copy to Napoleon. 
And yet there are other things in this book that caught my attention. On other pages of the book, there are marginal notes in Delambre's hand correcting data, explaining that much of this data that was presented formally was uh, in error, in some sense of the term error. Um, and though it's true that what Delambre predicted and what Napoleon predicted has come to pass, that Napoleon's triumphs did come and go, obviously, uh, the metric system today has succeeded in becoming this global system that 95% of the world's people use. But there are these troubling aspects of the book, uh, and in my quest to figure out what, what, how the meter was defined, I went back and looked at these marginalian notes, and then I took a hint from what Delambre himself had said in another part of the work, the base, uh, where he said that if you don't trust what I'm saying, if you don't believe these measurements, if you have doubts about what we did, I'm presenting it all to you here in this text, and in addition, I'm putting all the raw data all the log books and the like on deposit in the Observatory of Paris. So that if you know, anyone has any doubts in the future, they can come back and check. The Observatory of Paris still exists, of course. It's just south of the Luxembourg Gardens in France. And all that data is still there. I went back and looked. They are amazing. These are amazing calculations. Uh, seven years of labor, uh, tens of thousands of observations, all boiled down, of course, into a single number, the length of the meter. Now, Delambre's blog books are classics of their type. They're bound volumes with numbered pages, written in ink, and signed, actually, at the bottom of each page. Michin's log books are nothing like this. They consist of loose pieces of paper, written in pencil, unsigned, sometimes undated, and then pasted by Delambre into a large log book and annotated in pen and sometimes retraced. Now, I don't know if you can quite see this. It's a little hard. So this is Michel's loose leaf of paper right here, written in pencil but then traced over in ink later by Delambre. And this is Delambre's handwriting. You can see his name. That's Delambre's signature right there. And that's all Delambre's commentary all around it, talking about that particular loose piece of paper. And among the notes and comments that Delambre wrote, I found this. Because I have not told the public what it does not need to know, I have suppressed all those details which might diminish its confidence in such important mission, one which we will not have a chance to verify. I have carefully silenced anything which might alter in the least the good reputation which Monsieur Messien rightly enjoyed for the care he put into all his observations and calculations. Well, what details have been suppressed? Why had it been necessary to silence anything which cast doubt on the observations of Méchain? Part of the answer was in another set of documents in the observatory, a set of intimate letters between Delambre and Méchain. Letters Méchain had often begged his colleague to burn. Letters Delambre had placed under seal so that they might not be opened. Letters that had lain unread for 200 years. Letters that hinted at a terrible secret. I'd gone into those archives to learn about the meter to try to understand how we come to trust measures. What I learned was why the meter is wrong. The meter, by the revolutionary's own definition, is short by about 0.2 millimeters per meter, or about the thickness of two pieces of paper. But far more scandalous, I learned that the two men who had created the meter knew that it was wrong and that they kept that knowledge secret. This, then, is an error that has been perpetuated in every future definition of the meter. But, of course, what does it mean to say that the meter is wrong? To outward view, the two astronomers were remarkably similar men. Both were men in their mid-40s from the provinces just north of Paris, born to the lower artisanal orders of society, and trained by the same master astronomer. But they were men of very different character, and that difference would decide their fates. Delambre was the son of a rag seller from Amiens, north of Paris. As an infant, he had been stricken with smallpox, which had infected his eyes. As a result, he had permanently lost his eyelashes. And actually, you can even see this. And this, I finally found a real portrait of him from his own day. It was up in Sweden, uh, in the academy of all places there. Um, but he doesn't have any eyelashes. Um, and he was nearly blind as a child. He only slowly recovered his sight. 
And he also did not start practicing science at all until he was in his mid-30s. Then in short order became a very prominent astronomer. Um, his eyesight obviously recovered uh, sufficiently to be an observational astronomer. But this late start seems to have made him a somewhat more worldly person, an erudite yet cosmopolitan bachelor. Now the method of these two men involves citing large uh, imaginary triangles, measuring their angles. And here you see uh, a map of the triangulations around Paris, uh, focused on the Pantheon and sites in the surrounding area. Um, here's the Pantheon, uh, actually with a statue imagined at the time to, that was going to surmount it. And then here's another place they used. It's the cathedral at Bourges, a very beautiful cathedral, where they used the Pelican weather vane as their sighting target. Um, these angles are measured by a newfangled device, the Borda repeating circle, which was able to get very precise measurements uh, for uh, an object of its size. I mean, theodolites were tremendously huge and hard to transport and very accurate. But this is quite small. This is quite portable. It's about that big. Um, and was very accurate because you could get multiple sightings without resetting the zero each time. And thus, uh, uh, for example, the gradations uh, that were cut by the instrument maker for the separation of angles could over time be eliminated by multiple measurements or at least reduced significantly. But Delambre was not just a fine astronomer. He was good at solving problems of a political nature. In the Auvergne, for instance, he had trouble citing the distances between churches because the towers there were composed of black lava stone that was prevalent in that region. So what did Delambre do? He couldn't see these towers from a distance. He wrapped the towers in a white cloth, a little bit like, you know, Cristo would do. But the problem with this was that white was the royalist color. And this angered the local peasants. It's not that the peasants themselves were pro or anti-royalist, but they were worried that the town 20 miles down the road would think that they were royalists and come and wipe them out. So what did Delambre do? Well, he put a blue strip along one side of the white cloth and a red strip along the other and created a tricolor flag. So it was a patriotic expression of uh, French nationality, making everybody happy. That's the kind of cleverness he had. Méchain, though he was also of humble origins, the son, the son of a small town plasterer, was a very different sort of man. He was cautious and fastidious, a family man with three young children, but his scrupulousness was born of self-doubt. Méchain had begun his expedition at the southernmost part of his portion of the Meridian Arc in the town of Barcelona, where he needed to take the latitude readings of the city. He did so in the winter of 1792 from a makeshift observatory in the tower of the fortress of Montjuï, where he took 10,000 observations and sent off his data to Paris. And here you see from the town of Barcelona the hill of Montjuï. That was where the Olympics were staged um, a few years back. And here are some of the triangulations he did in and around the town of Barcelona. And you can see Montjuï right there at the scale of the map, right? That's Barcelona and the Citadel, and that's Montjuï. So it's just outside, just outside the time. And these are all the triangulations he made in and around that area. So he was done. He had taken these southern observations. He was going to continue on, contemplating his return to France, when two disasters struck in very rapid succession. First, war broke out between revolutionary France and royalist Spain, and the Spanish authorities told him he was to remain in Spain as a virtual prisoner. After all, he calculated the exact latitude of the most important fortification on the Spanish coast. <laughs> and then he suffered a freak accident. He went with a doctor friend uh, to visit a newfangled pumping station just outside town and was hit in chest by one of the mechanical arms. I mean, it threw him against the wall. It was an extremely violent uh, incident uh, and knocked him into a coma for three days, broke his arm severely. Uh, it took him many, many months to recover. So he's sort of a virtual house prisoner in a hotel in Barcelona and recuperating from this, from this terrible accident. So next summer rolls around, what was he to do? What he decided to do was, from the balcony of his hotel, from the, from the uh, plaza of his hotel, he would spend the entire season taking new latitude measurements uh, of the position of Barcelona. He takes another 10,000 measurements and then when he compares his new measurements of 1793 with his old ones of 1792, he discovers a discrepancy. One that, you know, taking into account the distance between the two sites, 
there remains a quite significant discrepancy between these two pieces of data. Now, how could he return to France and say, well, you know, the meter might be this long uh, or it might be this long? You know, which is it? I mean, that may not seem like a problem to you. It seemed like a problem to him, which is what, it's something I'll come back to. Back, back in Paris, after all, some of his scientific friends, Lavoisier among them, had recently gone to the guillotine. And another scientist had been imprisoned for falsifying data, though he'd also backed the wrong political party, which is, probably had something to do with it as well. Now, Méchain made a fateful choice at this point. He decided to keep the knowledge of the entire second year's readings secret. But this decision weighed on his mind. And then worse, Spanish policy changed. Suddenly, as a foreign national, he was obliged to leave. So he, couldn't, he wasn't in a position to resolve the difference. He left uh, for Genoa in Italy. And then after a year on the Italian Riviera, uh, returned to southern France, supposedly to continue his mission. But Méchant was unable to resolve the discrepancy and it began to torture him. He began to slow down in his progress, making almost no additional measurements in any given year, holding himself up in the mountains of southern France. This is uh, the, the kind of terrain he's working in, Mount Bougarac in, in southern France. Uh, and he really did, you know, while Delambre is doing, you know, 50 stations, you know, Méchant is doing like one or two. Um, his letters became stranger and more fraught, but he still admitted nothing. And in fact, he ends up hiding himself away in an abandoned monastery uh, in France and basically refuses to continue. His letters become suicidal. Delambre and his colleagues in the north of France were confused and worried. How could they coax him to finish? And you know, these, this, the data that he hasn't submitted from southern France, how are they to get him to turn it over? But at last they hit on an ingenious solution. They sent his wife. This was a stroke of genius because Madame Méchain was a capable woman and a competent astronomer in her own right. She had assisted her husband with his observations before the revolution and she wrote to Delambre and agreed to go to southern France and fetch her husband. Here's what she wrote to Delambre. Monsieur, you engage me to induce my husband to put the final touches on the important work with which you are conjointly charged. No one takes a greater interest in this than I, and I have long considered joining him myself so that I might bring him words of consolation and peace. I have told him emphatically not to accommodate me by proposing a rendezvous in a town appropriate to a lady. I will not waste even a quarter hour of his time because he does not have the time to waste. I have told him that I will gladly meet with him on a mountaintop, sleep in a tent or stable, and live on cheese and milk, that with him I would be content anywhere. I have told him that we will work together by day and let the night suffice for conversation. I am hopeful that the esteem and absolute trust he places in me will allow him to dissipate the unwholesome thoughts which devour his spirit and which against his will distract him from his purpose. When I am done with him, he will be ready to be delivered into your hands. <laughs> this, regrettably, is all that I, is in my power to do, my final effort for the good of the service, for the interests of my husband, and for glory. Needless to say, all of this must remain between you, me, and Monsieur Borda, who entirely approves of this plan. For all the world, I beg you, keep this secret. I have announced that I am going on a visit to the country, and no one knows the purpose of my voyage so as to give no one grounds to say she has gone to fetch her husband. I have the honor to be with feelings of the highest esteem, your very humble servant, Madame Méchamp. So though her name appears nowhere in the logbooks, there is every very good reason to believe that Madame Méchamp helped complete the final triangles which ended up pretty much here. This one almost certainly they measured together. That's actually me over there. Here the church. I actually recreated the voyage on bicycle, which was a lot of fun. I sort of visited all the sites, uh, biking up and down France. And then this is the last, this is the last site. Actually, they used the Virgin Mary's uh, head as their, uh, their, their target for sighting. It's a beautiful uh, purple stone uh, cathedral in Rodez, the town of Rodez. Méchain then returned to a hero's welcome, but he still hadn't told anybody about his unreported data from Barcelona's latitude. And the error became part of the definition of the meter or the 
discrepancy or the missing data is not included, and it's built into the platinum bar that becomes the new standard. Yet that, of course, was not the project's only error. Indeed, as happens so often in science, it is the unexpected errors, so-called, which are the most fruitful. As Enrico Fermi once said, if you make a measurement and it confirms your theory, that's nice. But if it degree, disagrees, you have made a discovery. In their drive for precision, the astronomers had discovered something quite new, that the Earth was more lumpy and misshapen than they thought. Not only was the Earth not a sphere, as they knew, and flattened at the poles, as they knew, it was, they now discovered, not even a curve of revolution. Each meridian was unique, and the curvature varied in a slightly irregular way. Ours is not a perfect Earth, they had discovered, but an Earth made in time by geological processes over many millennia. This was a genuine discovery, albeit one that some of them, like Laplace, had suspected before the mission began. In this sense, the expedition launched the modern science of geodesy. There was only one problem. The discovery invalidated the entire premise of the expedition. The astronomers had been sent out to measure a portion of the meridian so that it could be extrapolated to the whole and thereby used to create a universal measure. But because each segment of the meridian had a changing curvature, it wasn't possible to use the meridian one from France, the segment from France, to extrapolate to the whole. And in the end, what the scientists in 1799 in Paris had to do was take data from an expedition to the equator from the middle of the 18th century, 50-year-old data, and use it to get a much better approximation of the entire curvature. They knew that. They knew that this was going to be a rough approximation. And then, after the meter had been decreed and enshrined in a platinum bar, Méchain suddenly decides to take a second trip, to leave again for Spain to rectify his original error. Again, no one knew why he was doing this, why a man of 60 and at the height of his public acclaim, the director of the prestigious observatory would travel and leave his family in this manner. He goes south again, this time to extend the meridian measurement south of Barcelona to the uh, Baleares Islands, to Mallorca and Minorca. Um, and in a sense, his motive here is to leapfrog past his original errors in Barcelona and extend the arc all the way south. Again, everything goes wrong. Michelin has terrible luck. War breaks out, 1803. There's a renewal of hostilities of war in Europe, and as did a yellow fever epidemic. It was something of a suicide mission, and in fact, Michelin died of malaria on the Valencia coast in 1804. And only then did his papers, including those loose sheets of paper from the second year of readings back in Barcelona in 1793, return to Paris and fall into the hands of his colleague, Delambre, who now faced a fateful decision of his own, to reveal the error to the public or to continue the cover-up. But by then, Delambre had a new tool to comprehend error. The irony of this story is that Delambre Méchain's mission, with its attempt to push precision to a whole new level, had forced investigators to find new way to treat data. One of the savants, at the 1799 Paris conference, who had helped analyze the data from the original expedition, was the mathematician Legendre. Between 1799 and 1805, he had been stewing over this data. Was the lumpiness of the Earth due to the poor data or an actual physical phenomenon? He wasn't sure. What was the presumptive curvature of the Earth? Legendre's solution was to suggest that the most plausible curvature was the one that minimized the square of the deviations. This is the origin of the least squares rule. And this represented a radical new approach to error. Within a few short years, in the hands of Laplace and Gauss, it had become a method for managing and taming error by treating error as a given and instead looking for the ways or the equations which would best fit the data. By 1810, when he publishes the last volume of his famous Basse du système métrique, Delambre was able to use this new approach to come to terms with what Méchain had done. For Méchain, precision was an obsession because error represented a moral failing. He had been sent out to measure the meridian, and his honor and his reputation depended on his getting the most exact results possible. Méchain, like 
Newton, I would argue, was not a scientist, not a modern scientist in our sense of the word, but a natural philosopher, a man for whom science's goal was to seek out God's perfection, the understanding of which was not necessarily for public consumption. And because a savant's data were his own, Meschen did not feel obliged to share it, not even with his colleagues, and not even with the public, who after all, had paid for his entire expedition. This is quite different, of course, from a modern scientist's understanding of his or her duty. And Delambre had one foot, that's just the bus, right again? Sorry. Delambre uh, had one foot in this new world of modern science. He knew what he owed the public and the state, which had, after all, sponsored the expedition. He kept his records just like a public servant would, open for examination. The mission, after all, was one of the first instances of big science, a publicly funded research effort that took seven years and consumed more than three times the annual budget of the entire Academy of Sciences. That's like, it's three times the budget of all of science in the old regime. Uh, indeed, a good case can be made that the scientists deliberately chose to base the standard on the meridian rather than based on something readily measurable like the uh, periodicity of a pendulum and the length uh, of arc of a, of a period pendulum because the expedition was big science. Because it could, first of all, demonstrate the usefulness of science to a new kind of state, the republic. Why is science useful? Well, here's a reason. Secondly, because it could keep all the scientists gainfully employed during the revolution at a time when not to be gainfully employed meant some risk of being sent to the guillotine. And third, to do some interesting science, to wit, to determine what was the shape of the world, which Laplace had suspected was not necessarily of uniform curvature. Indeed, one way to read this expedition is a brilliant form of grantsmanship. So, while Delamre did publish some of the records Méchain had suppressed and write Méchain's secret data into the margins of his own copy of the base, he did not make public Méchain's attempt to suppress his data or to make his data appear better than they were. But Delamre did this for the opposite reason as Méchain. Méchain suppressed his data because he thought they mattered, whereas Delambre suppressed the details of Méchain's suppression because he understood it didn't matter. The bar was the bar. Now, Delambre by then had become the permanent secretary of the Academy of Sciences, the science czar of France, then the world's most scientifically advanced nation. The platinum bar was the universal standard, and as so long as everybody agreed that it was the standard, the meter could not be wrong. And so it has remained, even as the meter has been redefined to preserve the original erroneous calculations, obviously now renaturalized. In that sense, then, theirs was not so much a measure for all people for all time, but an error for all people for all time. <laughs> the Meridian Expedition had made the meter universal even though it was arbitrary. The meter could belong to everyone because it belonged to no one. Had the French revolutionaries simply declared the meter to be yo long, say as long as the Parisian owned, I do not think we would be using it today as the world's measure. So of course it doesn't matter if the meter is wrong, believe me, I know that. It doesn't mean, I don't mean to impugn the metric system, nor these two men who are men of remarkable integrity. And I'm not suggesting we go out and change Olympic swimming pools or anything like that. The success of the expedition, and this is what Delambre understood, was political as much as technical. What was the political success then of the metric system? The revolutionary scientists who created the metric system conceived of it as a political tool. These scientists were not simply content to describe the world. Their science and their metric expedition was an attempt to actively intervene in the world. It was intended to change the way people thought. It was designed to give all the world's people a common language to describe the most basic objects of their material life. This would allow the citizens to trade openly and transparently, transforming all of France and ultimately the entire world into a free market for the exchange of goods and services. These sciences were Democrats and liberals in the 19th century sense of that term. They wanted a measurement system that was easy for ordinary people to use and with decimal divisions and the other features of the metric system because, as Condorcet put it, 
Only when people could calculate their own interests could they really be free. In the end, the metric system was to make citizens into a calculating people. In other words, these scientists wanted to make ordinary people more like them. That was why they applied aspects of the metric system to all aspects of human life. They decimalized money. These are the assigna. And uh, because of inflation, <laughs> they go up into the hundreds of thousands, uh, the denominations. They applied it to card games. There's a revolutionary playing card uh, showing the meridian, honoring the meridian expedition. They introduced it for time as well, uh, including a 10-hour day with each hour divided into 100 minutes and uh, each minute into 100 seconds. This didn't last very long. Uh, and they introduced a revolutionary calendar, uh, which you know, many of you may have heard of, which had 12 months of 30 days and a five-day sort of uh, holiday at the end, sometimes six, for intercalation purposes. This is one of those you know, uh, you know, spinning dials that you can calculate uh, the days of the month. And I'm sorry, the, the quality of it isn't very, very good. Now, and some people claim that one of the reasons the revolutionary failed was it meant for 10 day, this was 30 day months with 10 day weeks. And as everyone noticed, it meant a lot less days off per week. Um, <laughs> this, this was a serious problem. That, and then some people said, well, we should have a day off every five days. And that wasn't very popular either with, with employers. What surprised the French scientists, though, was not just that these other elements of the, rev uh, the revolutionary metrical reforms failed, because, of course, we know they failed. We don't have them. But that the metric system itself was intensely unpopular. Though today forgotten, this debate over the metric system in France was the world's first fight over globalization. Debates over globalization today typically pit those who argue on behalf of increased trade as the best way to bring greater wealth and opportunity to the greatest number of people versus those who argue that local values should define local lives. And this is exactly the debate that erupted over the metric system in France. Most citizens of revolutionary France recoiled from the scientists' vision. I think Americans are well suited to appreciate it's not easy to give up one's habitual system of measures. After all, measures define our communities, and they mark out who we are willing to trade and deal with. <coughs> and France's local diversity of measures protected small town businesses from large city traders. And the citizens of revolutionary France were being asked to make an even more profound shift. You know, we're, we're comfortable, we find it, or may, as we all know, many Americans find it difficult to change their intuitions as you move from say feet to meters, right? Um, giving your height in inches, I'm sure is something that almost all of you, even here, still do, right? And you know, one's intuitions about things like weight and height are very built into the sort of units that you're familiar with. The citizens of France, as they move from the old regime to the new, of course had to deal with that, but they had to deal with something far, far, far more profound. Measures in the old regime in France were anthropomorphic. By that, I do not mean simply that a foot was roughly the size of average human foot. In fact, measures in old regime France were derived from human actions and human labors. For example, vinticultural land was not measured in square feet or any rough equivalent like that, but in days. How many days would it take to reap the harvest? Or a field of wheat was measured in bushels how many bushels of grain did it take to sow the land? Far from being irrational, these measurements were meaningful to those who worked the land, though not necessarily appealing to those landlords who wanted to increase the productivity. And if you think there's no difference between those sorts of measures uh, of the old regime and new ones, there are five hectares in Florida I'd be happy to sell you. What's more, the diversity of measures in France actually greased the wheels of commerce. That's because France operated on what was called a fair price economy. Prices for basic foodstuffs like bread were fixed. And woe to the baker who dared charge more than, say, three sous for a loaf of bread. He risked being strung up. You, you charge four sous for a, a three sous loaf of bread, and you will be you know, literally strung up. So what did a baker do when the price of flour rose? He shrunk the loaf. Now, were people stupid? Did they not notice? No. But the point was equity. 
a loaf was still three sous and everybody could pay three sous. And that's why a pint of beer was smaller in Paris than it was in Saint-Denis. It was a way of taking into account the obvious fact that prices in life in the big city are more expensive. Price was not the only variable that people used in the old regime. The quantity was part of it, and even the quality. So the quality of land got built into its measures as well. In sum, measures in the old regime, unlike measures today, expressed quality as well as quantity. And a community's measurements expressed its values. However confusing they might seem to us, they formed the backbone of the economy of the old regime. And that's why objections to the metric system were so fierce. At one point, the French government had to send in troops to confiscate old measures in the Parisian marketplace. And even this was not enough. In the end, the government actually retreated. In 1812, Napoleon Bonaparte, the emperor of France, the man who had said, conquests will come and go, but this work will endure, actually rescinded the metric system. And he scorned the scientists' grand ambitions. He said, quote, it was not enough for them to satisfy 40 million French people, he sneered. They wanted to sign up the whole universe. And not for another 30 years, until the 1840s, did France reinstate the metric system. And even then, it took another century to achieve full conversion throughout the nation. This is in 1875 at the time of the creation of the international standards. Now, I remember explaining my project once to a prominent French physicist. They said, oh, yes, yes, of course, I know, I know. Uh, the French were the first to create the metric system. So, well, but did you actually know the French were also the first to reject it? Yes, it's oh, you looked a little despondent for a second. They said, well, at least we're still first. <laughs> so what about the United States? Why haven't we adopted the metric system? Now, if Thomas Jefferson had had his way, we would have been the second nation in the world to adopt the metric system. Jefferson was in close contact with Condorcet and the other leaders of the Meridian Expedition. And he was extremely annoyed, however, by the French decision to choose a meridian that ran through France alone. As he put it, quote, we will have to take their word for it. Then his proposal for a metric system was rebuffed in the US Congress. After all, in the United States, there was relatively little reason to change. There wasn't the same incentive. Because the United States, as the creation of a, a single imperial power, Britain, already had roughly equivalent measurements up and down uh, the East Coast, the Atlantic seaboard of the United States, at least those measures in use. Now, there were definitely variations within the United States. But compared to France, this system was rather coherent. And of course, we had relatively little trade that was, you know, I mean, I know we had lots of trade, but relatively little trade compared to France with other nations, and uh, just given our you know, geographic isolation across an ocean. And given how much everybody hates to change their measures, we obviously have stuck with the old Anglo-American units until recently. Today, under pressure from global commerce, automobiles, alcohol, and bicycles are all sized in metric units, even in an economy now as large as the United States. And of course, all US scientists, as you know, use the metric system, and most, but not all, engineers. And that means for the first time in US history, the United States has two systems of weights and measures in regular use the Anglo-American system, and the metric system. And this is what has produced such disasters as the Mars Climate Orbiter. So though it may be decades yet before the general public all switches to the use of the metric system, in the end, I do think it is inevitable that the meter will one day be the measure of all things. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer some questions. Let's see. Okay, we, have, we have time for questions, and uh, if you'd use the microphone so that people in Boulder can also hear. And if Boulder, if you have any questions, just let us know to speak up. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, as, as you know, one of the big problems in changing over right. that it really isn't addressed in your, in your thing, and it might be worth to mention, is that, for example, you know, that, rec that crashing of that Matt Marr system goes back to the beginnings of the space program in the United States because launch services in the United States are where all the codes were written in slug pound, uh, foot pounds, and et cetera. 
And uh, if you go and revise those codes, you can kill somebody during, you know, in a launch service that, because you've got a very validated system and then you ch take something that has been just converted, cobbled over to another measurement system and, right. you know, you've got a lot of safety in the tradition there. And there's a team that's supposed to reconcile that, of course, and they didn't do a very good job or didn't do a complete job. But, but the, this, there, is, there are safety issues in changing over in measurements. It's not just arbitrary. No, absolutely not. That's right, of course. I mean, that's what makes uh, conversion very difficult is in all these different ways, history matters. The fact that for many years, uh, manufacturers have built physical machinery sized around particular units or safety codes are built around things makes you know, a good uh, metaphor is the metaphor of inertia. And I do think it's very, very hard to change. It took, it took, in France, from 1799 until Second World War to completely convert over, really. You know, and you could still hear vestiges of it, even as a younger person traveling through France. You would hear, hear, still hear people calling, using the term livre for a pound. Now, it was now 500 grams, sure. It wasn't, you know, 450 whatever. But... Habits take a long time, and there are built-in parts of, you know, manufacturing and software and all kinds of things that are very difficult to convert. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's loss when you do, or a risk of loss. Uh, let me ask a question, too. Sure. Did you find any evidence uh, in the uh, work of, of the uh, two astronomers for the concept of uncertainty in their measurements? Sure. I mean, they had to sort of measure the properties of their theodolites and whatever they did would have some estimate of uncertainty. Right. Did you see any of that? Oh, absolutely. That's the central problem uh, that is, in a way, the hardest for us to reimagine ourselves back to their day, I think. That is, these are really smart people, <laughs> and they are very diligent, and they have a lot of integrity, and they do understand that when they take measurements, it's not perfect, but they don't have conceptual apparatus that we take for granted. For example, the distinction between precision and accuracy, the use of, you know, all the sort of developments that, that we can associate with Gauss and Laplace associated with how to deal and normalize error. They just don't have that apparatus. Now, they know that there's such a thing as an outlier or a data that doesn't fit their other data, but they are, in a sense, trying to guess at perfection. And so for somebody like Meschin, uh, who really sits on this, you know, I would argue, on the other side of an intellectual cognitive divide from us, a, a divide and actually on which I would place Isaac Newton, right? Um, so again, this is not to impugn the importance of the work they do or to suggest that they're somehow tricking. They just don't have this apparatus for dealing with measurement error, and they don't actually conceive of it as error. They think of it as a um, mistake. Well, right. When it's an outlier, it's a mistake. And if they get it wrong, it's a potentially a moral failing. What happens right at this period, it, because of this expedition in large part, is a reconceptualization of the tools of error, a distinction between uh, different forms of uncertainty between uh, accuracy and precision and a set of ways of, you know, treating data. It's also the moment when astronomers come up with the idea of a personal equation, right? The, the very common notion to us and not to them that everybody has idiosyncratic, based on their own physiology probably, you know, in most cases, of lags and differences in how people observe in astronomy and how do you deal with that? They don't say, oh, it's just subjective, it means anything goes. No, you have mathematical tools for treating the data, right? And that's what we all take for granted. We understand that measurement comes to us through a veil, right? And we have statistical methods. Statistics doesn't exist for these people at all. And Delambre is just half in our side of the world. And I mean, I think that's really, you know, one of the things I found the most intriguing about, you know, studying these people is just, how hard it was for me to conceptualize the way they could think about data. But I do believe that in some senses they are not the, the Meschins and the Newtons of this world. In some sense, they're doing science, but I would not call them scientists, to put it as sort of provocatively or sharply as I can. 
couple things. First of all, there is a certain similarity between this story and the story of the Millikan uh, oil drop experiment where he excluded data. Sure. But how do you know there was an error in the, in the uh, value that was finally adopted? Maybe the first right. set of measurements was actually correct and the second one was wrong. Correct. Good questions. Um, right. So in terms of how, how, how um, practicing scientists today deal with that, what Millikan did, uh, as some of you may know and others may not, was toss out outliers. Um, I believe that would be considered a no-no based on, you know, he said my runs are going and, you know, he's not supposed to do that. Obviously, he was right, um, again, uh, and he had good reasons, I think, for throwing out his outliers. So it remains part of scientific practice, though. I don't know how publicly acknowledged it is or is supposed to be. So I could say much more about that. So I don't want to suggest that this, what Michin did was right. Some sort of completely uh, uh, unusual, all right? It remains something that is done. Uh, your other question was about what was the source of error. Well, here I'm relying on uh, uh, an astronomer in the era that was after Laplace. It was, in fact, one of Laplace's students, Nicolet, who went back and did, you know, the, the, the data looked at the data that Delambre did publish and uh, reanalyzed it. And what he was able to show was, if you're willing to, to, to have a, a lower degree of precision, you can reanalyze the data. And in fact, there's not that much of a discrepancy at all between the two pieces of data. What probably happened, now I'm giving away a bit of the book, but that's OK. It's in the book. I don't mind. Um, this, the advantage of this repeating circle, of course, was you didn't have to re-zero it. But because you had to use it over and over and over and over again, the machine was probably wearing. And it produced a kind of drift. And so there was a problem that was, um, you know, over time, uh, you know, the, 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 the verticality of the instrument was probably uh, impaired. Although he tried to correct for it in many ways, uh, he probably didn't. If you reanalyze his data um, to correct for that by using different stars, you can actually show that his second set of data and his first set of data aren't that different. It was all in his head. He didn't have these tools, though. He didn't have these conceptual tools. Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, in addition to variations in, in, in measurement standards, of course, there's also a large variation of currencies. And you've spoken about some of the political motivations of this effort. And I wonder if you can comment on the connections between standardization of currency and measurement and how one impacted the other and how that, this, this effort may have in part been motivated by that. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, in France, um, there was actually, you know, several currencies are in, in, in use, although primarily they did have greater standard of currencies than the United States did. The United States actually had many different forms of currency in the late 18th and early 19th century. Um, clearly there, decimalizing currency, right, in terms of the units, but they are also, actually, the French attempted to uh, create a silver standard that was using the metric system and based their money on silver at the time. So there's no doubt, in many ways, it's a national project. I mean, getting control of the national currency is one of the first things a centralized state will seek to do, and it's no doubt it was part of the project. The other thing is, it was very connected to something called the cadaster, which was to map all of France for the purposes of taxation. All of this is a set of proposals about centralization of France and getting sort of national control over the economy. But I do want to point out that I, these people are largely to be understood in the 19th century sense of that term as liberals. Most of this is to create a national market for, within France at least, free trade, at least as compared to what had existed under the old regime. If Talk you. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you go back and look at the record book of public laws passed in 1866, the first one in the book is a biggie. The first one is an act ending an insurrection among several of the states. And then a couple pages later, they say, and by the way, it's OK to use the metric system. Was there a connection? Was there something having to do with Reconstruction where they saw this as, an, as a point worth bringing up at the time? Uh, that's a great. I, I, I don't know the answer. Um, it's interesting, the timing. I do think that you know, there were changes afoot in Europe at that time that may also explain it. Much of the impetus, of course, for the meetings of the late 
19th century that resulted in the new international agreement came from the attempt by the French after they've readopted the metric system in 1840 to get other nations around them to adopt the metric system as well. And I know, you know, in our American-centric way, of course, the, the Civil War and Reconstruction is tremendously important. It may explain what you're talking about. But that decade is also the decade of the Franco-Prussian War and the attempt of the French to get the Germans to join their system. You know, one of the things the Germans do is they notice, of course, that, you know, geodesy has made more accurate measurements since the 1790s. And they notice that, you know, the meter is defined by that platinum bar in the French archives is you know, roughly 0.2 millimeters short. That's not a secret, right? You, more accurate geodetic data. And the Germans originally assist, insist that they're going to go out. This is exactly what's happening in, in 1860s, 1866 through 1870. The Germans and French are negotiating. And the Germans insist, well, we should measure the Earth again and get the meter right this time. And the French, you know, go crazy because that means every single meter in France is going to be now going to be wrong if they do remeasure. And there's a huge negotiation. The war breaks out between France and Germany. Of course, Germany wins. And then in its magnanimity in the 1870s through 75, agree to just build a new bar to match the old bar, not to go out and you know, recalibrate, as it were, with the globe. So you're part of the American story. I'm sorry I don't have a full answer. But that inter those international treaties, which the United States is obviously later signatory to, right, are driven in part by events in Europe. Uh, let, let me ask a bolder question. Okay. <clears throat> How did they determine in 1790 that Barcelona was at the same uh, longitude? I mean, uh, latitude. Lo longitude. longitude. Uh, yeah, oh. if you're going to be on the same meridian, it's right. important that you're going sure. you know, straight. And I thought the big problem of the day was longitude, not, not latitude. So, yeah. Yes, you're absolutely what did right. They do there? Well, first of all, they're not quite on the same. Uh, there we go. They're not quite, and they corrected for that. I mean, they know that, whoops, I can, I can point with my, at a distance here. Uh, right, they're pretty close to Dunkirk. Now, what you're right is absolutely that longitude is difficult to determine, but especially at sea, right? I mean, if on land um, with accurate clocks, there are really, you know, several pieces of data you need. You need to, to do this calculation, right? I mean, there are many, many subtleties, and they take into account the fact that these triangles are on a curve. I mean, you know, there's, they're, 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 they've got, they know a lot of the approximations that they're making. But obviously, you measure these triangles. They had to measure two bases, right? They could have done one, but they wanted to be extra careful. So there's a base down here that they actually measured on land over the course of about 10K, laying out over 40 days, um, roughly 12-foot um, platinum rods first for 40 days up here and 40 days down there. They obviously measure all the triangulations. And then, yes, they have to make sure that they're running along that axis and figure out these, these distances here. That's the other, the other calculation. But So they bring clocks with them? Uh, they, yeah. They, 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 with enough time on land, I don't think that the, the longitude problem, the, the big longitude problem is when you're at sea, you know, at uh, some unknown and remote and changing distance. Um, and, of course, clocks with all the rockiness of the boats and everything else. Mm. But on land, I don't think it was as much of a problem. They certainly didn't. They don't talk about it as a worry. Okay. One more question. Yes. <clears throat> we, we're rather Eurocentric, or America Eurocentric here. Yes. I'm just curious as to the historical situation, for example, in China. Sure. They must have had their own set of measurements. Right. And I assume by now they've adopted the, the, the metric system. Yeah. But when did they do that? And, and, you know, can you give us some details? Sure. Um, I can't give you too much details on, on China, although I do know they adopted it at the time of the revolution in, what, 1911. And then, of course, over the course of the revolutions of the middle 20th century, um, the, that was probably more, more thoroughly enforced. It, it always takes a long time, I think is the first short answer. Uh, a somewhat longer answer would go like this, that we tend to think of the meter as uh, 
Well, the metric systems have been adopted in countries around the world at times of great political rupture, even revolution. And that may be another reason why the United States, though it had a chance at its revolution, did not then do it. And maybe Reconstruction would have been another second American Revolution moment to try to push it, which makes, you know, at least plausible. I mean, I don't know the details, but makes it plausible. But if you look at South America, if you look at European countries, if you look at uh, Russia slash Soviet Union, if you look at China, it's moments of political revolution where the political will is mustered to make this change, legal change to the metric system. What then happens is it takes a long time. And uh, in various forms of industry, in popular use, and even among scientific and engineering communities, it will take a long time. And it's the degree of enforcement and the diligence of the state in attempting to enforce it that drives a fair bit of the story, as well as international commerce, how much you really do want to sort of be on the same page with allies or trading partners in other parts of the world. So I can't answer in detail about China. I do know that they adopted it in 1911. I recall. Uh, tied to this uh, issue of metric versus uh, you know old system, there's an issue of decimal versus binary system. Uh, so we managed to, I think, mostly go to decimal system. Uh, right. Uh, how, how did that tie into it? Sure. Um, there had been various proposals for adopting decimalization of units prior to the revolution, but of course it's only with the, the revolution that the metric system is developed as a package, right? It's not just so it's a standard, uh, it's a, there's a series of elements, right? There's the nomenclature, there's decimalization. But you know, one of the things they considered at the time of the French Revolution was whether or not the metric system should in fact be decimal. There was a proposal for do a decimal, base 12 system, and there were some mathematicians who argued that it would be a far better unit because you know, it was easier to divide by three and four and you know, had more, uh, more subunits. Um, that was then quickly pushed aside because of the difficulty of calculation. There was even one mathematician, Lagrange, who suggested, and it's never quite clear whether he was joking, but this is only what a mathematician would say. It should be base 11 because it was a prime number and not divisible. So I was like, can you imagine? But uh, decimalization uh, was you know, perceived as, because of you know, being in line with the, 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 the arithmetic numeric system we use, to ease calculation. But it was just one of the elements of the metric system, right? The idea that the, the systems are all interrelated, as you know, that there's a nomenclature that explains uh, you know, magnitudes. All of these were presented as a package. And I think that's in part what made it particularly hard to adopt. So I didn't give you all the details, but as the French back off in the early 19th century from the metric system, they back off in stages. They first say, oh, well, let's just get rid of that nomenclature. It's really confusing everybody. We'll just have simple names for, uh, in fact, they called the kilometer something like a mile, mil, right? Rather than calling it a kilometer, there was a meter and then a mile, which was 1,000 meters. So they back off the nomenclature. They keep backing off things one by one until they, they rescind it. But each element, in a sense, was controversial and disputed, right? The, the relationship between weight and length was something that they wrestled with quite a lot. Should it be, you know, what temperature of water would be the best temperature to look at? Should it be four degrees or zero? Thank you. I just want to remind you all there are books back there if you want to have a look and uh, read the book and get more details. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks.